999ers risk their lives every day keeping us safe. We do this job to help people. But all too often, they're abused and attacked. The vehicle threw me like a rag doll. It should have killed me. These personal attacks on police, paramedics and firefighters are at an all-time high. Ah! I admit, I was absolutely terrified. We don't put on this uniform to be assaulted. Leaving them traumatised and unable to work. It felt like I was saying goodbye to my career. But while the violent criminals responsible are hunted down and brought to justice, Run, you do not to our protectors fight to get well and back on the job. I was not going to give up. There was no way. It took a hell of a lot of hard work to get back to the place I'm just now. Ready to face the next critical incident. Today, police officers race to help a colleague who needs urgent assistance. You can just hear them begging for help. We are really struggling here with this mail. I'll be honest, I pushed the car to its limits. A paramedic's journey to work ends in a savage assault. I was sort of screaming, I was on the floor, um, and it was just, just a wrestling fight, really. And we see inside the specialised treatment centres helping injured police officers get back on the beat. And these are things that start to give them that confidence back. I went in still on crutches and then um, I came out with no crutches. Wiltshire is one of the safest counties in the UK with lower crime rates than most other parts of the country. And PC Matt Baker is proud to serve there. I want my family and my children to grow up in a community that is safe. I want to make life better for them. So, yeah, I think that's why I do it. And his reputation amongst his peers is second to none. I would say he's probably one of the hardest working police officers I've ever come across in my time. He's very reliable, you know, I like, I like him along my side in any sort of given situation, he's, he's that sort of guy. He was the one who showed me how to be a police officer and he is a kind and caring person and that's how he polices. But Matt's dedication to the job was seriously tested one night in 2017 when he was victim to a prolonged violent attack. It's one of the few things in my six years that has really left a mark. Um, I had nightmares about it. I can truly say, I mean, I've experienced lots of very nasty things, um, but this particular incident uh, is something that I will remember for the rest of my career, if I'm honest. It was a summer's evening, and Matt had just started a night shift. A call comes in about a row between a couple at a bar that's got out of hand. So Matt attends along with a female colleague. When we arrived at the scene, we were informed by a member of the bar staff that the male had left the location, the female was still inside, but denied anything had really happened. You know, certainly nothing that we should be concerned about. Um, it was a waste of our time being there, etc. But we made the informed decision that we would escort her home safely. Um, the female opened her front door and the male was at the far end of the living room. Um, she announced our arrival and presence um, and he turned around and there it was, anger written all over his face. Get out of my house now! We're not going anywhere. Don't you dare come any closer to me. You kind of think, oh, where did this come from? OK, and then you try and use your, your voice and communication to, to bring it down a level, um, try and converse normally, um, but he just wasn't having any of it. Get out of my house now! His demeanour and character meant that we couldn't just walk away. You can arrest me! Get out of my house now! Get out of my house now! He then pushed her, laid his hands, laid his hands on her, which is um, an assault. Get out of my house! Enough! Enough! 
In the face of such aggression, Matt tries to restrain him. Behind your back. Hand behind your back. And that's where it all went wrong from, from there. He seemed to have Hand behind your back. superhuman strength or just no bearing of, of pain at all. But as Matt struggles to control him, his partner is cornered. Oh. Matt's colleague sprays the offender with parva, similar to pepper spray. That had nil effect on him, but here I am with parva running into my eyes, blurring my vision, making my eyes stream, choking up, coughing, um, battling this guy that's, you know, nearly six foot. So I just had spun him and then sort of drove him away from, from my colleague and into a very tight kitchen space. And I sort of forced him up against the, the wall. The idea was to sort of pin him and restrain him. Because again, we're, we're not there to hurt people. We're, we're there to establish what's going on and just, you know, do our duty. And, you know, this is all in pitch black, in surroundings that I don't know. So I, I know I'm in a tight kitchen, but I don't know what's where. As the situation reaches crisis point, Matt and his colleague activate their emergency button and call for backup. What is this address, please? Get out of my house! What's the address here? PCs Sean McGee and Becky Burney were also on duty that night. Suddenly the, uh, the emergency button goes on our, on our radios. When that goes, you tend to stop talking or whatever you're doing and you're focused, you're listening in intensely as to, you know, why, why that button's been pushed. Uh, I could hear sort of cries, screams. Uh, I was aware that they were in serious trouble. It certainly sounded like it. I was probably a good, I've got to be a good six, seven miles out. Um, so I, I wasn't minutes away, unfortunately. I was hoping that I'd done enough to sort of have him pinned, um, but he was giving a, a very good fight, um, climbing all over me. And as Matt is holding him down, the offender yeah. even sinks his teeth into him. You're fighting me? Yes, I'm fighting you because you can go. <laughs> That's an assault on a police officer. <laughs> what are you going to do? Stop fighting me. You can just hear them begging for help, and there's nothing you can do. Um, so we blue lighted it there as absolutely quickly as we can. Sean is an impeccable driver when he needs to be. I'll be honest, I, I, I pushed the car to its limits, and I wish the car was quicker or we could get there quicker. I find my head being driven towards this sink area, and in there I can see a, a, a large kitchen knife which has stood blade up, pointing up. And I'm thinking, this could really go horribly, horribly wrong. Later, Matt struggles to hold on until backup arrives. I thought that he was generally trying to kill them. Yeah, I was in a fight for my life. There were over 26,000 reported attacks on police officers in England and Wales between April 2017 and April 2018. That's one every 20 minutes. Four, two, one, I've been stabbed in the arm. But there are dedicated places these attacked officers, or any officers with injuries, can go to recover. Specialised police treatment centres. The centre aims to aid police officers' recovery from injuries, either physical or psychological injuries, um, and basically get people back to work as quick as possible. Almost 4,000 serving and retired officers attend the treatment centres each year with admissions lasting two weeks at a time. 
people often say to people, this is the, the one chance in their life, potentially, that they will have two weeks to devote entirely to their own well-being. Don't have to worry about work issues, don't have to worry about home issues. It's all about them, and they have a two-week period where they can just look at everything that's going on uh, and get themselves in the best possible place to get back to work. Some seek support for mental health issues, while others need treatment for physical injuries. Turn your toes in towards each other. He's broken the tibia and fibula bones in the leg. He's had a couple of surgeries now, haven't you, to correct this. But at the moment, Glenn's here to try and prevent having the further surgery. Most of the time, it's a confidence builder. There's a lot of people who potentially, through an injury, have stopped using that muscle or that joint. Therefore, they're a little bit reserved and a little bit sort of cautious in what they do. The warm water, it just encourages a bit of blood flow, encourages a bit of nerve activity, which means that they can find their movement gets a little bit smoother, so it can sort of stop them from being as protective over their injury. We're going to find that steady position. You know, they're coming from post-surgery. This is probably the first exercise that they've been able to do. So for the balance and coordination class, it's all about uh, refinding some reaction speed and time uh, within the patient's muscles. These are things that start to give them that confidence back. We're going to start on a gear eight. I can feel that my back itself is getting better. Um, so I'm feeling a lot more positive now and I'm definitely on the mend. I went in still on crutches and um, I came out with no crutches. There are two police treatment centres and one police rehabilitation centre in the UK. It was here that PC Josh Williams spent time after he was seriously injured in an incident that could have cost him his life. I attended our rehabilitation centre, which is Flint House. The physiotherapy that they give is it's amazing. Um, so I've been there twice. Their residential stay, so you stay there for two weeks, um, basically breaking yourself and getting yourself fit again. Josh was working a late shift in 2016. I was on a three till midnight shift, I think, and a call for a break in progress came out, so a burglary, um, which is the job that everyone wants to go to and wants to Nick the bad guy. When Josh arrived, the burglar, who had stolen scaffolding from a building site, was making his getaway in a van. I responded from Corn, which is sort of the next village along. Where we are here, it was a temporary traffic light system, um, so only half the road was accessible. I responded up on blue lights and came just near to where this police car's parked, came to a uh, yellow transit van which fitted the description of the vehicle involved in the incident. To stop the criminal escaping, Josh used his car to block the exit. So I've gotten out of the vehicle, showered him to get out of the car, nothing's happened, I've gone towards him, nothing's happened still, um, at which point then I've gone to cross between the paths of my vehicle and his, so bonnet to bonnet almost. I remember breaking a window on his van, so from that I must have got my baton out to do it. He's come forward after going backwards and I've been between my vehicle and his and at some point I've been struck. I can't tell you where I was hit, but then I've fallen between my vehicle and his. I remember seeing him speed off, um, at which point I've kind of said to myself, that could have been a lot worse and then tried to get up and then realised it was quite bad. I tried to get up and my leg bent in a way that it's not meant to bend. I've stayed on the floor and shouted up over the air to say this vehicle's made off and I've, and I've been run over and asked for an ambulance. While Josh waited for help, members of the public came to his aid. Two members of the public came over. It was kind of a, oh my God, what's happening? And I was, I was still talking to the control room, um, so they stayed with me. One of the chaps, um, I was on my side. Um, I couldn't move to lay on my back or lay on my front, so he kind of supported me for the whole time that I was there. Although Josh was injured, he was more worried about the burglar who had escaped. I remember the frustration of seeing a vehicle ma making off from me and not being able to do anything about it. And I was more concerned that we needed to get people here so we could find him. The longer you leave it, the less likely you are to find this person. And that was more my priority than anything was making sure that we went and got him. 
the officers arrested him less than 15 minutes after. He was not very far away. He'd come off a roundabout and abandoned his vehicle. So two officers from my shift have located the vehicle. Um, he wasn't anywhere to be seen, at which point a police dog's become involved and tracked this male hiding in a bush or some bracken face down, at which point he was arrested. The hit-and-run burglar pleaded guilty to causing grievous bodily harm with intent to resist arrest. Due to the extreme and serious nature of the offence, the judge ordered him to serve three years and nine months at Her Majesty's pleasure. Josh was rushed to hospital and his injuries were severe. I had a compound fracture, so both parts of my lower legs snapped in half and then came through the skin. Josh needed an operation to fix his leg, but the doctors warned him the risks were high. The risk you have with open fractures is infection. So they say about one in 20 of my injury will still lose a leg um, because of the infection risk and the trauma that you have around it. I had an operation in which they inserted a uh, metal nail down the center of my leg, um, and then that was bolted together. So that's the operation that I had. Luckily, Josh's leg was saved. After four months, Josh was able to return to work, but only to desk duties. Sitting in an office, you hear the jobs come out, you see everyone rush out to it, and it's a real gut-wrenching, I can't believe I'm not going to that job. And when you're sitting there effectively not, not doing what you're used to doing, although you're working, you're not doing what you want to. Following a further operation and another four months off work, Josh returned to full response duties. And then when I was back to work fully, I wasn't the same for probably six months. Um, I wasn't who I was. And when you get injured like that, it weighs quite heavily on your mind. I still carry an injury. It changes the way that you deal with things. It changes the jobs that you want to go to. And it makes you shy away from things, which isn't who I am. It took me a while to get past that. It took some words from an inspector to basically say, you know, what happened happened. It's not going to happen again. You need to be back who you were because it's affecting you. A lot of people can see that. Um, and helping to move past it and just accepting it. But that's all time. It takes time to do that. Today, Josh is revisiting the scene of the crime, which still has an impact on him. Obviously, this, this is quite a significant chapter in my life. Um, it's, it is emotional coming back. It very much has formed who I am and what I do now and what, what I'm like. There's a bit of a gut-wrenching feeling to come here because, you know, I know what happened here and what, what could have happened um, and what did happen. Although Josh will have metal plates in his leg for the rest of his life, he is still dedicated to his work and proud of what he does. I would happily say, you know, looking back, I'd do exactly the same as I did before. That person needed detaining, they needed arresting, and you're not going to do that by sitting inside your car. You have to get out, and there's a point at work where you have to act, and that's how I would still act. I, yeah, I enjoy what I do. I still look forward to coming to work, and that's why I put the uniform on. Police officers often have to think and act quickly to keep themselves safe. In this clip, two police community support officers arrive at a convenience store seconds after a would-be robber has pulled a knife on the terrified shop assistant. Though the attacker chases the sales assistant, the officers put themselves in the firing line to make sure the shop staff get out safely. The violent criminal then turns on the officers, threatening first the male, who defends himself with a shopping basket, and then the female. But as this thug runs amok, throwing stock around the shop, he trips himself up, giving the female officer a chance to escape and, crucially, time for backup armed with tasers to come in. The offender is finally brought to the ground and arrested. He pleaded guilty to attempted robbery and was sentenced to three years in prison.
still to come. Backup arrives for Matt, but the offender is not giving up easily. You know, the initial scene is we've got managed to get through the door. It's just horrifying. Just get Matt out of here. I mean, Matt looked like that he couldn't go on any longer. And perseverance gets paramedic Kathy back on the road. In terms of her mental strength, it was phenomenal. I look back at the photos now and I feel proud of myself that I didn't give in. Our colleagues should be arriving shortly. They're going to need to know where we are. In Wiltshire, PC Matt Baker is desperately trying to restrain a violent man while waiting for backup to arrive. My piece is out. During the struggle, my earpiece got ripped out, so I couldn't hear anything um, of what was going on. But obviously, my colleagues could hear what I was saying and, and the struggle. All you could hear was these high-pitched screams, then periods of silence, heavy breathing. It was blood curdling. It's the only way I can describe it. Uh, at that point, I felt absolutely helpless. As the struggle continues, Matt begins to fear for his and his colleagues' lives. During the course of everything that was going on, I then heard my colleague saying, he's got his hand on my throat. <laughs> and this guy's repeatedly saying, I'm going to kill you. You're going to die. <laughs> repeatedly. You're dead. Um, look at you, you're nothing, you're nothing. You then start to wonder, am I actually in the fight for my life? Yeah, I was in a fight for my life. It's, it is that simple. Um, because I believed him. <laughs> Sorry, I get really upset, it was really... Um, yeah, with the um, open mic system where we can hear exactly what's happening, um, I could hear, I'm, I, I, I could hear, I'm going to kill you. And with hearing them not being able to breathe and the, the cries for help and the choking because he was strangling one of them, I generally believe he was going to try and kill them or he was trying to kill them. PC Rob Dent and his colleagues have already finished their shift when they also respond to Matt's emergency call. It sounded to me like the guy was killing my colleague. That's what it sounded like. It felt, it sounded like the life was being drained out of her voice. It was like gasping for air and it was, and then, then the quiet afterwards. You just don't know what you're going to. Get your hands off my colleague! No! Yeah, I feel no shame at all. I grabbed his throat and I mustered every last bit of energy and strength that I had to use such force as was reasonable in the circumstances to prevent any further harm coming to me or my colleague. QJ, we are really struggling here with this mail. Nothing seemed to drain him, you know, it was... And that was my, one of my fears. Where is everyone? Who's come in? How long is this guy gonna be able to, to keep this up for? Um, how long am I expected? to hold the fort. This is PC Rob Dent and his colleagues' body-worn footage as they arrive on the scene. I heard sirens, so I knew they were close. And there was a massive sense of relief. Just, you've just got to wait for the cavalry now. 
you know, and they're seconds, if not a minute, away. So just hold on, hold on as best you can. So that's that's what we did. I was the first unit on scene with Becky, and we're desperately trying to find the right flat. Um, I could hear the other sirens. I knew there was other units en route. I just remember screaming their names, like, where are you, where are you? And I found an open flat, and I could hear noise from that flat, and I could hear them shouting, and I just ran in. Ah! Ah! When they came through the door um, and the light came on, that was almost like a sense of they've arrived. Um, the the re re relief of tension was, was palpable then for me. Get him secure, please. I remember seeing Matt, and he, he looked like that he couldn't go on any longer. We literally got there right at the right time, I guess. Oh. You know, the initial scene as we've got managed to get through the door, it's just horrifying. In front of us was this guy, he had all the two of our colleagues. We had to wrestle them out from sort of out, out under his arms. There was tears everywhere, people right. clearly injured. Get Matt out of here. <laughs> all right. Mate, keep going then, mate. Keep going. Oh, Matt couldn't even walk. He was that drained. <laughs> Immediately could see that he uh, was perspiring excessively, uh, but to the point of absolute exhaustion. Matt just went to the floor. He was, I think, completely blinded by Parva. Sweat's just carrying it back into my eye, mate. <laughs> He was shaking, he was just soaked through. Um, it was just, just horrible. Oh. Oh. That's it, well done boys. Eventually we managed to, you know, detain the gentleman involved. But yeah, it was horrific, absolutely horrific. Stay where you are, Matt. <laughs> this incident went on for 16 minutes. 16 minutes of, of doubt. Well done, mate, did well, did well. Good work, good work. You know, people were there like, you're right, you're right, you've done brilliant, good job. Yeah. And you're thinking, how, how is that, that, what's just happened, a good job? <laughs> the fact that we're still here, let me deal with you. I've got you now, all right? So we'll let this guy go. I've got you. Guy's in handcuffs. He's on his way to custody. Good job. Get up Point. on your feet, mate. That's it. Now walk out of here. So I focus on that rather than the, the bruises, the aches, the pains, the, the distress, the vulnerabilities. Am I good enough? Am I going to last? Is this it? You kind of have to accept that and say, well, thank you. <laughs> but also, thanks for coming. Does anyone know why you're being so mean? Well, well you bit one of my colleagues and put a one down to the floor. Okay? That's why you've been arrested, and that's why forced me to get you. So mean? Is there any idea in having the deck there? Can you just, just let me go? I only came in to make an inquiry and you were assaulted. I've not done anything wrong. You bit them. That is something wrong. As Matt and his colleague are helped from the building, they are both in shock. And I just remember that we, we were sat in the back of the van um, and I just remember that we, we were holding hands for, for a really long time without saying anything. 
um, certainly shared one of the darkest moments of both our lives, I think, it's fair to say. The offender pleaded guilty to assault occasioning actual bodily harm, an assault with intent to resist arrest. He was sentenced to 14 months in prison, suspended for two years. To attack emergency service workers, I think, is, is quite heinous because you're stopping us from helping someone in their deepest, possibly darkest hours, you know. So, yeah, if. If there's ever a message, please don't. <laughs> Later, Matt struggles to come to terms with the attack. We're over a year on from that incident, and it's just kind of, when's, when's that going to just fade into nothing? While most violence against police is spur of the moment, Sometimes they know that there's danger ahead. In this pub CCTV footage, three officers have answered a call from a community nurse about a man with a history of violence and serious mental health issues. They follow the man into the pub where he later admitted that he was waiting for them. As they enter, he levels a gun at them. They quickly move to get the firearm away from the man, but not before he lets off a shot. After a terrifying struggle and with help from a member of the public, they finally disarm the man. Shockingly, a search of the man's bag found several weapons, including two handguns and homemade petrol bombs. The three officers received a bravery award for risking their lives. And because of his serious mental health issues, the offender was sentenced to an indefinite hospital order. Attacks against emergency service workers are not limited to police. Paramedics have seen a 36% rise in assaults over the past five years in Britain, with eight now reported every day. In Yeovil, paramedic Cathy has worked with the ambulance service for 14 years. We do what we do because we want to help people. And we do help so many people. We attend emergencies. We can range from I think, you know, delivering a baby to um, someone who's got chest infection to a road traffic accident. People who are terminally ill do what we can for them and uh, enjoy it. Every shift is different, but there is one part of Cathy's routine that stays the same. Normally, I like to have a cup of coffee before I sort of either on my way to work or when I get to work. And I had got into a bit of a habit of stopping off at the local garage, which is literally just opposite the ambulance station, just to pop in and get a coffee so I can start my day, I wake up a little bit. But one wintry morning, this coffee stop would see Cathy subjected to a horrific attack. It was 20 past five in the morning, February, dark, quite cold. I pulled up and got out of the car. Out the corner of my eye, I saw this male. He came straight up to me, very close, very demanding. You need to take me home. I've got to get home. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't take you home. I have to go to work. He reached over and snatched the car keys out of my hand. And when I went to try and grab them back from him, he then attacked me. He then grabbed me around the throat and dragged me towards the shop. As we were struggling, he, he pulled quite a lot of my hair out. In the struggle, we kind of moved um, from the car. I, I was sort of screaming, I was on the floor, um, and it was just, just a wrestling fight, really. Despite only being yards away from work, Cathy couldn't get anyone's attention to help. He had put one hand around my throat and the other holding my head, so I was a bit sort of incapacitated, really, as to how much I could do. A uh, car pulled up on the forecourt um, and then drove off, so they didn't help. After another five minutes or so, with us wrestling on the floor, he then let go and then walked off down the road. Bloodied and bruised, but relieved, Cathy was in shock. I had to then call the police. 
And obviously I was distressed and upset and trying to talk on the phone, but very emotional. Um, but the, the police call taker was, was amazing. And she just, she calmed me down, you know, said everything will be okay. Police are on their way. We work with the police officers and the police officers that arrived initially, I knew them. So, which was lovely because I felt safe then. Kathy's attacker was caught and found to be suffering from mental health issues. He was sentenced to a two year community order, including a rehabilitation program, medical treatment, and paying £60. But for Kathy, the ordeal wasn't over. I went home after the incident and just lay in the bath for such a long time because I was so stiff and bruised and sore and, and just. Um, ached all over, really. Kathy had damaged thumb ligaments and torn a shoulder muscle. I can say it's the most excruciatingly painful thing that I've had to go through. I couldn't move it, basically. As a result of her injuries, Kathy was off work for a total of nine months. Recovery was slow, but extremely painful. I then had post-operative complications because I had a frozen shoulder, so I couldn't, um, I couldn't move it, basically. But it was the trauma of the attack that cut the deepest. Personally, I was scared. I was scared to go out on my own. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere without my husband. Um, I certainly wouldn't go out at night. So I did, I did have um, post-traumatic stress counselling. All Cathy wanted to do was get back to work as quickly as possible. We are a family and we've got a very strong network. We all come together, we support each other. It has affected Cathy. I think she'd probably admit that. It's not just the physical part of the assault, because that heals, but the emotional side of it carries on for many, many years. She's now back full time. And despite having to pass the scene of the incident every day, she's determined to keep serving the public. I have to drive past it every day when I go to work. And every day I look over and every day I remember what happened. In terms of her mental strength, it was phenomenal um, to deal with the incident, to process it, to want to come back to work as well. Um, and with a little bit of input from me, and it was only a little bit, uh, it's all credit to Cathy, um, that she came back the, um, as quickly as she did. It gives me a strength, and I look, I look back at the photos now, and I feel proud of myself that I didn't give in, and it's certainly made me a much stronger person for it. Get my out of here. <laughs> Right. Mike, Back in coming, Wiltshire, Mike, PC <laughs> Matt Baker and his colleague have endured a violent attack while on a routine call. Matt needed a year of checks after being badly bitten, and 14 months on, he still suffers from other physical injuries. Uh, I've got rotary damage in my left shoulder, um, disc issues in my lower back now. Um, and I'm undergoing physio at the moment, uh, awaiting an intensive physio treatment um, away at one of the rehabilitation centres. Um, I went through some very dark periods, um, stress, anxiety, nightmares for, for a while, um, lack of sleep. I can picture his face quite vividly um, and hear his voice extremely vividly, you know, with, with what he was saying. Um, we're, we're over a year on from that incident, and it's just kind of, when's, when's that gonna just fade into nothing? Will it ever? I don't know, but, you know, I'm trying to put it where it should be now. Matt's colleagues were also traumatised. Yeah, it was, it was horrendous, and it upset a lot of people, including uh, my other colleagues uh, from the other shift. I have had nightmares since. Um, I've spoken to people about regarding not being able to get there quick enough. I can remember going, you know, and obviously you've got your foot to the floor, you're going as fast as you can safely to get to the officers that need help. 
but the nightmares I've had since have been about me not being able to get there quick enough. It's slowly, my foot's to the floor, but I'm not moving, the car's not moving. We expect a certain amount of aggression. We expect a certain amount of violence. We're trained to deal with it. But we're not trained to be injured to the point where you have nightmares. But you do reflect on it, and it made me realise that actually, you know what? I might wear this. Yeah, but we're all human beings. Matt's a father. You know, we bleed like anyone else. You know, we're not robocops. And, it made, and I think it made you realise that actually, yeah, we are, we, are, we, could be, we can be quite fragile at times like anyone else and we can get as hurt as any, any member of the public can. My boys are six now, and for them, I've always been, you know, this, this superhero. Our daddy catches us bad guys. Um, having to tell them daddy's not superhuman and that I'm just a normal guy trying to do the best job that we can, um, yeah, that's, that's tough. That was really tough. Um, and they, they don't quite understand yet, but they'll come to learn it. But despite the long-lasting effects, Matt is determined he will put that night behind him. You know, I'm fortunate I've got some really good relationships, friends, family that are there to support, and they've sort of helped me through the process. Since getting together in 2018, Kim is one of those who is supporting him through his recovery. I've seen a massive change um, in Matt, and I can see that, that, you know, slowly he's getting that confidence back now, and, you know, being able to look more to the future and trying to put that all behind him. Matt's still in his job, serving the public, and happy to do so. I like to think maybe I've got even better or a little bit more savvy or just a little bit more willing to think that just anything could, could happen at any one point. But again, it doesn't affect how I walk through someone's front door doesn't change how I engage with a person one-to-one. -one. I, I, I'll put myself in that situation every time. Yeah, I think a lot of people would have walked, would have said, I'm not going to put myself up at risk and you know, with my family and everything else. But fair play to him, he's still here, and he's still giving it 100%. Now it's about you know moving on with my life and putting all this where it should be, which is in the past, um, and looking forward to future. <laughs>